Good morning, good morning, everyone. What a historic day for Chicago and Illinois, as well as the entire Midwest. I'm Illinois Transportation Secretary Omar Osman. I was actually told this event was going to be huge, so I'm glad we are able to get one of the biggest spaces in downtown Chicago here at Union Station. Thank you to our partner at Amtrak for hosting us in this beautiful facility. I am so pleased that we are able to get members of the Congressional Delegation, the Federal Railroad Administration, the Union Pacific, the city, the county, and many other project supporters, including right here my good friend, former Secretary Ray LaHood, all in one spot to commemorate this occasion, the first day of the 110 mile per hour surface between Chicago and St. Louis. Yes. This, this, wa this was one of the most challenging, complex projects ever undertaken at the Illinois Department of Transportation. But today, all the hard work and patience pays off. The concept of a high-speed line across Illinois goes back decades, with the work actually starting almost 13 years ago. At this point, I would like to give a huge shout out to the IDOT team, the FRA team, and a lot, of, a lot of them are here for their endurance and for their tenacity and for making sure that this project comes to fruition. Thank you. But I'm so, I'm so proud to say it is being delivered under the leadership of this one governor who knows that an investment in transportation is an investment in people. Without further delay, Governor J.B. Prisker. Governor. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Very right over there. Well, thank you very much, Secretary Osman. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you to all of the federal and state and local and private sector partners for joining us this morning. It's a great day. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you all to Chicago Union Station, one of the busiest transit hubs in the entire United States. After over a decade of anticipation today, the first high-speed trains from Chicago to St. Louis took off for their 110 mile per hour journey. With this final piece of the transition to high speed, we've cut down on the travel times and boosted safety, reliability, and convenience along the way. Federal Rail Administration Deputy Administrator Jennifer Mitchell is here with us today, and I'm so proud to bring this project to completion under her leadership and that of the U.S. Department of Transportation and the Biden-Harris Administration. I also want to thank Amtrak for carrying this project to the finish line through multiple presidential administrations, ensuring that Illinois' connectivity can continues to lead and serve the nation. This moment also wouldn't be possible without the partnership of Union Pacific, represented here today by Senior Vice President Scott Moore. Investments like these not only connect our cities, they allow our residents to access new jobs and to start new businesses. And they bring neighborhoods and cities closer together to collaborate for the betterment of our entire region. Illinois is the only state where all seven of the nation's largest railroads operate. That's a unique economic advantage recognized by employers across the globe and it has helped our state attract and maintain quality jobs and to grow our transportation distribution and logistics industry to one of the nation's largest. By upgrading to higher speed service on Illinois' largest passenger rail line, we are solidifying our status as the transportation hub of North America. Now, I'd like to recognize and thank our terrific Illinois congressional delegation led by Senators Dick Durbin, who's here with us today, and Tammy Duckworth for shepherding the federal funds necessary for this project to our great state. 
Between the Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and our own Rebuild Illinois Capital Plan, we're replicating this success from Cairo to Lake County. This is how you build jobs. This is how you gain economic opportunity. Rebuild Illinois includes over a billion dollars to expand our and improve our rail systems, including projects up and down the Chicago-St. Louis high-speed rail corridor. We're working with the federal government to extend passenger rail service to Rockford and to the Quad Cities, making improvements to passenger rail service between Chicago and Carbondale, and launching the Springfield Rail Improvements Project and create projects that will benefit both freight and passenger transit. What's happening on our railways is just a microcosm of the monumental collaboration of the federal government, the state of Illinois, and local governments to modernize our infrastructure, creating jobs and shaping vibrant communities and connecting every corner of our state. With that, I'm very proud to turn it over to uh, a longtime champion for Illinois and for high-speed rail and a friend, our former United States Secretary of Transportation, Ray LaHood. Ray? Thanks, Governor. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good, mo good morning, everyone. Thank you, uh, Governor. And uh, th this uh, facility we're in is a magnificent uh, train station, uh, been uh, rehabbed and fixed up uh, almost back to uh, its original uh, condition uh, when it was uh, first built. And I, I am delighted to have been uh, considered uh, to be a part of this uh, by the governor and his staff. And I just, the part I want to play here is to go back and retrace just for a moment uh, the history of uh, this investment. When we came into the job of DOT secretary under President Obama uh, in 09, President Obama, Vice President Biden, and then Chief of Staff Rahm Emanuel put $8 billion in the economic stimulus bill, which was $870 billion. And that $8 billion was $8 billion times more than had ever been invested in rail in the United States because of President Obama's vision for implementing rail in America and improving rail uh, in America. And also, it didn't hurt that his vice president got up every day in Wilmington and rode the train to the United States Senate and back home that night. These, these were the rail men of, uh, of our generation. They were the visionaries. And if it hadn't been for that $8 billion, we wouldn't be standing here today because that's the money that then we allocated uh, to come to this project that will deliver thousands and thousands of students to universities all across uh, central and southern Illinois and deliver people uh, from St. Louis uh, all the way uh, to Chicago. Uh, this is an important project uh, because one of the visions that President Obama, Vice President Biden, uh, and all of us had was to speed up the train. And that, that's really what these investments uh, are allowing us to do. We couldn't have done it without Union Pacific, who really uh, controls the, the rails. And uh, they, we worked with them. Uh, we reached agreements. And then also uh, our friends at Amtrak, who deliver the service uh, every day uh, to so many people. Uh, we all know that Illinois is a, a railroad-centric state, maybe more than any other state uh, in the country. And this is a capstone now for passenger service uh, for people uh, from northern uh, to southern Illinois and southern Illinois to northern Illinois. The other person who had a great vision uh, is Governor Quinn. He and I work very closely on this. He really wanted to make sure that Illinois was getting its fair share of rail dollars. And we worked very closely with Governor Quinn and his staff, and he deserves an awful lot of credit, too, uh, for his, his vision uh, for rail. 
I, I want to say a, a word about um, the vision that I think uh, Governor Pritzker has had for transportation. I, I know a little bit about transportation, and I know if you don't have the leadership at the top, the way we had the leadership at the top with President Obama, Vice President Biden, when it comes to, to rail in America, we've had the, the leadership at the top, and it's been bipartisan. When that transportation bill was passed and the gas tax had to be raised, it was Governor Pritzker's leadership. And I'm very proud, too, that some Republicans in the General Assembly voted for that bill. And I'm proud of the fact that Governor Pritzker knew that he could pass that bill with Democratic votes only, but he knew that transportation is bipartisan, always has been. There are no Republican or Democratic bridges. There are no Democratic or, or, or Republican roads. Transportation is bipartisan. Governor Pritzker, thank you for your leadership, not only in this, in seeing this finished, but in all of your leadership around Illinois on improving transportation. It's a win-win for our citizens, uh, for the state of Illinois, and certainly uh, for our country. And finally, our equally great partner in all of this on transportation was Senator Durbin. He and I, when I was in the delegation, worked very closely together on a great project uh, in Springfield uh, and many other projects. And he was at the forefront of making sure that when the two, the, now this is really ancient history, two Republican governors turned down the money for high-speed rail, one in Florida and one in Wisconsin, and I say stupidly they turned it down. Senator Durbin, one of the first people on the phone, how do we get that money in Illinois? Well, we get it in Illinois with the kind of leadership we have in Illinois, uh, not the least of which is our outstanding senior sen senator, Senator Dick Durbin. Thanks, Ray LaHood. Let me acknowledge some members of the uh, Illinois congressional team who've arrived. First, uh, my colleague Jan Schakowsky. Jan, welcome. Danny K. Davis, who is here. Bill Foster and Chewy Garcia. Let's give them a round of applause. And of course, Mike Quigley. He's in the back row, Mike Quigley. Steve Goodman. Steve Goodman was a songwriter and a Chicago folk singer. You may remember him from the 60s and 70s. If you go to Wrigley Field and the Cubs win, it's his song you're singing afterwards, Go Cubs Go. But probably his most famous song was about a train that leaves this station to this day, the city of New Orleans. 1970, he convinced Arlo Guthrie to make that song a national hit. The lyrics of that song are memorable. 15 cars, 15 restless riders, three conductors, 25 sacks of mail. But basically the song is an epitaph. It's a funeral song for passenger rail service in America. As you said, this train's got the disappearing railroad blues. He didn't have much faith that there'd be passenger service beyond that time. And if you look around, it was a pretty obvious conclusion. Passenger rail service had declined to a terrible low in the United States. We looked at Europe and saw their wonderful fast trains and just marveled at the fact that they made plans to include passenger rail, and we didn't. But things changed. As Ray LaHood mentioned, in 2008, a man was elected president of the United States who decided to make a fundamental change in rail service in this country. His name's Barack Obama. He's from the city of Chicago. He understood what rail service meant, and he understood what passenger rail service could mean in the future. So he offered up $8 billion, by federal standards, not an enormous sum of money, but an incentive for a lot of states to step forward and envision what might happen to passenger rail service if we started investing. Well, we decided in the Illinois congressional delegation to go to work. We knew coming from the president's home state, we would be suspicious, suspected if we won, so we had to have the best application of all. And we put it together. And we submitted it to Ray LaHood, the Secretary of Transportation, Joe Zabo with the Federal Railroad Administration, and a number of others who helped us make the decision to move forward. That investment made a significant difference, which we're celebrating today. 
100 mile an hour trains. It's amazing. 284 mile corridor that has had $1.6 billion of the $8 billion invested in it. It's going to change things all up and down the line. We understand that that's an investment in the future. And we also understand that we've got to work together, not only bipartisan, but federal and state. I want to salute Governor Pritzker. The, tra the trains sponsored by the state of Illinois that are on this route make a real difference. Last night, we'd, I dropped my wife off here at the station. She took the train back to Springfield. I asked her this morning, how was it? She said it was packed, and it's packed almost every day. People understand what we have here, quality service, passenger-oriented service that can make a difference in individual lives and make a difference in our economy. So it's been an honor to be part of this effort to make sure that Illinois got its fair share of the federal funds. I want to thank all those who participated in making it possible, but remember, it was President Obama who rejected that stereotype that America couldn't have quality passenger trains. I'm glad he had the initiative to move forward and we've been able to be part of that process. We've had state and local officials, I mentioned the governor is certainly committed to this, but we've also had local officials who've made a difference as well. Tony Preckwinkle is president of the Cook County Board. She has been committed to this transportation project. It seems like every time I meet her, it's at Union Station. So there's clearly an interest in that field. I thank Tony for being here today and introduce her to you, there. President Tony Preckwinkle of the Cook County Board of Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to thank Governor Pritzker, Secretary Osmond, and the staff at IDOT for their leadership and dedication to this project, as well as Secretary LaHood and Senator Durbin for their federal support that helped make it possible. I want to acknowledge and thank Ray Lang of Amtrak, Union Pacific Senior Administ Chief Administrative Officer, that's a mouthful, Scott Moore, and FRA Deputy Administrator Jennifer Mitchell. My thanks as well to the staff at IDOT, Amtrak, Union Pacific, FRA, and the other agencies who've worked so hard to make this vision a reality. As some of you know, I'm a railroad person. My paternal grandfather worked on the railroad, and my maternal uncles worked on the railroad. I always say <coughs> railroads are made up of, railroad staff are made up of tribes, and they were the dining car tribe. Um, for black folks, when I was growing up, you could either be a Pullman porter or you could be a dining car waiter. And they were all dining car waiters. I'm glad to say that there are many more opportunities in railroading now for people of color, both men and women. This high-speed service is a demonstration of our dedication to sustainable transportation solutions. By encouraging more people to choose rail travel over driving or flying, we'll collectively contribute to reducing traffic congestion lowering carbon emissions, and building a more environmentally safe future. The high-speed service we're announcing today is just the beginning. The same partners here today are also working on the Chicago Hub Improvement Program to modernize Union Station, making it more convenient and pleasant for customers, as well as making key improvements around the region to allow Union Station to handle more trains. Doing these things is a precondition for a vision we share of expanded Amtrak service across the Midwest with the Chicago as a hub. When I walked in today, I was pleasantly surprised at how beautiful the lobby looked. The last time I can remember um, being here, it was <clears throat> for, I think, a Chicago Community Trust event in which they were beginning to fix the ceiling, and it fell, part of it fell during the dinner. So it's beautiful, and I'm grateful to everyone who's involved in making the investment in restoring it. Today marks a turning point for high-speed rail. Let's celebrate this achievement and look forward to the incredible journeys that lie ahead. Thank you, and please welcome Ray Lang, Vice President of Amtrak. Thank you all. Thank you, President Preckwinkle, for that introduction and for everyone's wonderful remarks here. Um, it is an honor to be here um, and represent Amtrak at this really um, amazing event um, celebrating the establishment of really high-speed rail between the city of Chicago and St. Louis and all the intermediate city pairs. And I really do want to sort of deviate from my remarks. And Governor, just thank you and, and your secretary, Mr. Osmond, um, and the IDOT team 
uh, who, many of whom are in the back here and many of the consultants that did all the work here in the back here for the amazing work that they did to um, make this vision a reality. I have 29 years here at Amtrak um, and started working on this one the day that I started. <laughs> so it's a very emotional day for me and it's wonderful to see it come into reality. It really is. Uh, it's a wonderful corridor, one we should be very proud of. Um, I bring you all greetings from our chairman, Tony Kosha, um, from our CEO, Stephen Gardner, who could not be here today, and from my boss, our president, Roger Harris, and the 20,000 Amtrak employees around the country, several of whom are, are here with us today. Um, they are just as excited as I am and just as emotional as I am about this amazing, uh, amazing day and um, have you know, graciously chosen me to be the Amtrak rep to, to speak at this wonderful event. Lastly, one more person I will introduce, the um, Chairman Emeritus of the Amtrak Board of Directors, who Senator Durbin, thank you, Senator, nominated to our board, Tom Carper. Raise your hand, Tom. Yeah. Tom is uh, on our Board of Directors still. I think it's coming up on around 15 years now, Tom, but he, uh, he did a five-year stint as chairman of the board uh, of Amtrak. Um, and I first met him when he was mayor of little old Macomb, Illinois, and we're just thrilled for his longstanding leadership um, here at Amtrak. We're really here this morning to celebrate what my boss, our president, Roger Harris, describes as a makeover of our service between Chicago and St. Louis. <clears throat> the IDOT, Amtrak, and Union Pacific team have delivered travel times now that will make a real difference to the Amtrak customers. With speeds on much of the route up to 110 miles per hour, we will now bring Bloomington Normal to under two hours um, travel time between Chicago and Bloomington Normal and Illinois State University. Springfield will now be less than three miles from downtown Chicago. So our members of the Illinois State Legislature who are here in the room, uh, you have a much quicker travel time between downtown Chicago and, and Springfield. And then um, ultimately St. Louis will be now under five hours. Uh, which is remarkable because most of the, the trains, uh, most of the Amtrak trains that have traveled historically between Chicago and St. Louis have been well over five and a half hours. So um, we're knocking, you know, well over 30, 35 minutes off of the trip time for all of, uh, all of those frequencies. And there's more trip time savings coming in the future with uh, the improvement projects coming in Springfield and elsewhere along the line. Uh, the four daily round trip trains that, that the state funds that we operate on behalf of the states are being outfitted with all new rolling stock Siemens manufactured venture cars. I hope many of you will come out and have the uh, opportunity to ride the venture cars, a very transformational uh, service with expanded Wi-Fi, with um, expanded bike racks, better accommodations for the ADA community, a really modern um, forward-looking uh, way to travel um, that's really representative of, of what Senator Durbin and Secretary LaHood talked about when they talked about the, excuse me, the transformation of, of rail, uh, not only in the region, but in this country. It's all been made possible really with, uh, as Secretary LaHood said, um, the funding provided by the Obama administration all those many years ago and really now um, with the IIJA. And I really want to thank the members of Congress, including my member of Congress, Mr. Davis, and Senator Durbin uh, for their leadership in passing the IIJA. Uh, the, the future is really bright um, with the IIJA and the 66 billion, which is putting into this mode of transportation and assuring us that uh, these kind of investments will continue in the future. So I'm optimistic, I'm thrilled, I'm honored to be here today. Um, I want to turn it over next to our partner in providing the service for the state of Illinois, Mr. Scott Moore from Union Pacific Railroad. But everybody, please come out and ride the trains today all aboard. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ray, Governor Pritzker, Senator Durbin, Secretaries. It is my pleasure to be here today representing Union Pacific Railroad my CEO, Lance Fritz, and our 32,000 employees. And obviously, when a railroader takes the mic, there's a little history to start with. And you think about 174 years ago, in 1849, they started building a railroad from Alton to Chicago. And of course, Union Pacific in Illinois, uh, there's that little fact of that old Illinois railroader, who be, railroad lawyer, who became president in, in 161 years ago this week, signed the Pacific Railway Act that created Union Pacific Railroad, which ultimately built the Transcontinental Railroad, celebrated the Golden Spike in 1869. 
Now, there was hundreds of years of the heyday of passenger rail on Union Pacific. And uh, Senator Durbin, you painted the picture well with the city of New Orleans of uh, ultimately what that became. But we're here to celebrate the day. Because over the last 50 years, there's often times where how do the freight railroads and passenger railroads work together? You know, I didn't negotiate this deal. I was out on the West Coast working in California. And I told the governor about then, they go, those folks in Illinois are on to something. They're going to have something that they are going to celebrate connecting an urban core to urban core in their careers. And that's what we're doing here today. They'll have, they'll have something great in California, but the common sense in the Midwest made sense. And this is how freight railroads and our passenger partners can move forward in the 21st century. And that's why I'm here on behalf of Union Pacific to celebrate. And with that, I'd like to turn the microphone over to Jennifer Mitchell, Deputy FRA Administrator here from Washington, D.C. Thank you very much, Scott. I'm very, very happy to be here. And thank you, Governor Pritzker, IDOT Secretary Osman. Um, congratulations to the Illinois Department of Transportation. This is a very exciting time for passenger rail, as many of you have heard, um, and a very exciting time for the people of Chicago, St. Louis, and those from many communities in between. The Federal Railroad Administration is very proud to support the Chicago to St. Louis corridor and the project we're celebrating today. Over the last decade, we've invested over $1.4 billion in this corridor and with good reason. The corridor provides much needed passenger rail service to over 13 million people. Achieving 110 miles per hour will get riders where they need to be faster and provide an alternative to congested highways. New rolling stock will be provided, which will add comfort and conveniences. These enhancements will improve reliability and safety too. This includes safety upgrades at more than 200 grade crossings to help prevent collisions. 39 rail highway crossings are going to be closed entirely. New gates and fencing will help protect pedestrians and increase safety in local communities. As Secretary Buttigieg has said before, when train service is faster and more frequent, many people will get on board. Excellent passenger rail has clear benefits, not just to riders, but within local communities and economies. I'm very excited about the potential at new stations in Dwight, Pontiac, Carlinville, and Alton. The renovations to the Lincoln stations, improvements to the Normal and Springfield stations, and the continued progress at the new multimodal station in Joliet. I know dozens of FRA staff, many of which are here today, have helped to support today's project. And they'd want me to recognize all of the partners at the state and local levels who made this, these improvements a reality. I also want to recognize the hard work and collaboration with our partners at Union Pacific and Amtrak to implement positive train control, which is instrumental to achieving higher speeds that we're celebrating today. And it's very fitting that we are here today. The Biden-Harris administration is hitting the road this week to highlight how the president's investing in America agenda is transforming our country for the better. 35,000 infrastructure projects and funding awards across 4,500 cities and towns have already been announced to rebuild our roads and bridges, strengthen our ports, and to make our coastal communities more resilient. Just this month, FRA announced 63 projects in 32 states from our railroad crossing elimination program, which is going to impact more than 400 grade crossings nationwide. And we're just getting started. The President's bipartisan infrastructure law includes $66 billion for rail and the largest investment in passenger rail since the creation of Amtrak. So thank you, Senator Durbin, as well, for your support, and to Senator Duckworth. These investments mean good things for the Midwest and beyond. More projects, like the $3 million FRA awarded through our Fed State program for the Chicago Union Station concourse improvement last year. More projects like the Village of Franklin grade separation project and another grade separation project further south in the city of Decatur, which was announced this month. Importantly, these investments mean delivering world-class passenger service to more Americans. So today is a reminder that we are on our way. Congratulations again. And now I would like to introduce Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton.
Good morning, everyone. I'm Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton, she, her pronouns. And thank you, Jennifer, for that warm introduction and for your steadfast leadership and expertise as Deputy Administrator of the Federal Railroad Administration. Since all of our other speakers have had a chance to introduce themselves, in the interest of time, I just want to thank everyone here, fellow elected officials, agency leaders, and distinguished guests, for their hard work ensuring we have the infrastructure to connect and grow. It is so great to stand alongside Governor Pritzker and all of you to celebrate this milestone in high-speed rail service. This is a defining moment in not just moving people, but moving our entire state forward. When we invest in efficient and reliable transportation, we're really building an even stronger economy that opens doors to economic opportunities and strengthens our ties to each other. As this Amtrak train makes its way to St. Louis, it demonstrates the power of collaboration and all we can accomplish when we join forces at the federal, state, and local levels. This is what we mean when we say that Illinois is at the center of everything. We are proud of our legacy as the heartland of transportation in North America, and we will continue paving the way to deliver transportation improvements that uplift every region of our state while prioritizing safety. You know, I often quote an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. But I think I'm going to revise it today and say, if you want to go fast and far, take Amtrak's high speed rail through Illinois. Thank, thank you again. And I'm now going to turn it back over to Governor Pritzker to answer any questions. Governor. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to take any questions from members of the media. Dan. Look, we've all worked together uh, to make sure, and we're talking about the Congress people as well as our members of the General Assembly and everybody who cares about this program to provide health care, uh, to provide this program for 63,000 people in the state of Illinois. And we're continuing to do that. In fact, there's room for a few more uh, within the program and within the budget. Remember that the General Assembly uh, provided $550 million for this program for FY24. That's about $300 million more than we had originally proposed in our budget. Uh, that's a good thing. And we need to make sure that we're living within our uh, fiscal um, you know, limits within the state of Illinois. That's something that wasn't done for a lot of years in Illinois and now here uh, in 2023 and going into our fiscal year 2024 balancing the budget and making sure that we're paying our bills and expanding and providing uh, undocumented immigrants with uh, health care that's like Medicaid uh, is an important thing for us to continue to do. Well, you have to remember that uh, we provide a certain Medicaid rate for people on Medicaid, uh, and the rate that was being provided to Cook County was a super rate above that Medicaid rate. Uh, and so all we're doing is bringing Cook County back into line with all the other jurisdictions uh, in terms of the Medicaid rate that's being paid for undocumented immigrant care. Sarah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, as some of you know, uh, a great philanthropist and businessman uh, here in the city of Chicago, Jim Crown, passed away yesterday. Uh, he was a good friend to many. Uh, beyond just people in the business community, he cared deeply about this city and about the people of the city. He was a tremendous philanthropist. 
um, supporting programs for people who had been left out and left behind. Uh, and someone who just on his own time and with his own heart uh, reached out to help so many people across the city uh, to meet with me and with the mayors over a number of years to make sure that everybody's heading in the right direction in terms of lifting up the entire city of Chicago. It's a great loss for all of us uh, and uh, for me and for my family who were friends with him and his family. Um, I, I want to make sure that I send my condolences and my full heart to all the members of the Crown family. Turn it over to an expert. It, it, it would definitely. I'm going to phone a friend too. So, John. So, uh, on the PTC, I think we, we have started that in 2015. 2015 time frame for this line. Uh, my recollection is that's how we started for the 90 mile an hour. Then we upgraded that. So, would you elaborate? Yeah, absolutely. So PTC was started. John, first of all, John Oymoyne, he's the uh, deputy director for rail for IGA. Thank you, Secretary. So working very closely with Union Pacific and with Amtrak on implementing PTC on this corridor, it is something that uh, you know was was taken wholeheartedly to have implemented you know within the corridor. What we did was we took incremental steps. We brought it up to 90 miles an hour. We brought speeds up to 90 miles an hour got that running successfully, then tested at 110 miles an hour to successfully today where we're moving forward with implementing the new schedule with uh, PTC being implemented along the, uh, the entire uh, high-speed rail corridor. Yep. Thank you. Vladimir Putin is paying a heavy price for the invasion of Ukraine. He not only has in military setbacks which have led to his attack on innocent civilians, he's seen himself branded a war criminal for the barbaric acts that he's engaged in, and now, in almost unprecedented in history, a direct confrontation with dissenters and those who don't agree with his policies and it comes to Ukraine. He's paying this heavy price, and he should. It is outrageous what he's done in Ukraine. We're watching it very carefully. We want to maintain stability in the situation as best we can from afar. But this is being uh, sponsored and authorized by Russians, not by others. Yes, sir. All the experts behind me are going to answer that question. <laughs> all, all the above. I think the track itself costs over $700 million. Uh, there's right away that we needed to acquire, all the fencing, all the PTC, um, and then the locomotive and the, and the rail cars. Uh, those, those are the, if you, if you want to look at the entire expenses, the uh, track project itself, along with the rail cars, are probably the two dominant expenses for the rail. Yep. Uh, first of all, you know, this, uh, this whole project speaks for itself. When, when we started looking at it back in 1992, I think Ray Long was talking about 29 years, th this, whole, uh, this whole project was conceived as a good alternative uh, for people, uh, you know, to transfer the entire state. Good option. So um, it's, it's going to be less than five hours for us to uh, make it from here all the way down to St. Louis. We, uh, we project that, that, you know, we're going to even save some more because 
there is still a little bit of modeling we are doing between Alton and East St. Louis and between Joliet and, and Union Station here too. So I don't know if that answered your question. I don't know. Ray, uh, Ray Lang, would you have an answer to it? What kind of projection we have? Yeah, it's Ray Lang with Amtrak. Um, I'll just say a couple of quick things on that. In 2006, we doubled the number of frequencies in service between, Mr. Winters remembers that, we doubled the number of frequencies in service between Chicago and St. Louis, we doubled the ridership. Um, we won't double ridership this time around because all we're really doing is increasing speeds, but where you will notice, where we think we will penetrate the market better is between Chicago and St. Louis. Um, the capacity right now on the trains is, you know, we have very high ridership between Chicago and Springfield, and it drops off after Springfield. We really think that now we're going to begin to penetrate that market in a meaningful way south of Springfield and really begin to compete really with the aviation industry between St. Louis and Chicago. So that's where we'll see the increases. <laughs> you want to ask Union Pacific that question? <laughs> <laughs> It's their railroad. I mean, I think you build more capacity in the infrastructure for more, um, to accommodate more frequencies that are faster moving than the Union Pacific freight trains. Do you want to talk about it? Well, I, I um, Jennifer? I mean, everybody be nice to, everybody be nice to Jennifer. She's got the check. Um, but it, yeah, um, I'll answer this and I'll leave it to others to answer. Um, the state of Illinois, you know, has submitted an application for the, cor the FRA's quarter ID program, you know, to apply for federal funding to do planning for more frequencies and improved infrastructure on that service. Um, we're awaiting the results of that. I don't know, Omer, if you want to say anything, or Jennifer, if you want to say anything. She can't. So. <laughs> we, we, we are just waiting on the uh, federal government to make an announcement, and we are hopeful. That's all I'm going to say, I guess. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, and, and absolutely, um, what both Ray and the Secretary said, that's the first step for us to take that forward. That planning would come out of that, uh, that study that's done. We would then engage with the host railroad, with our partners at, at Union Pacific, to move that forward. Just some of the techno th technical things that we would do is start that modeling process, understand what the rail traffic is, and what would happen if we added additional trains into um, what Union Pacific is running, and ultimately what we would want to run for additional frequencies. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to take the podium back. Um, and just uh, before I take the last question, I just want to make sure all of you know that uh, there are some state-owned uh, Amtrak Midwest cars that are available for tours on track one. So right after this, feel free to go take a tour. Um, Sarah. Uh, only that we're excited to have him uh, come to town, and, and of course he'll, uh, we'll have a very successful fundraiser for him um, with uh, a ton of support. I mean, he is well-liked in Illinois and in Chicago, and, uh, and there are uh, lots of folks who are stepping forward to help his re-election campaign. So. Sure. Sure. Um, I think we all understand that if people can get preventative care, uh, that that uh, keeps us from spending more money later on and, of course, keeps people healthy. And that's my goal. And that's my, the goal of the Latino caucuses and of the broader community of advocates. Um, always, always, when we talk about universal health care, which is something I believe in, uh, that we talk about uh, wanting to do that, but of course we have to do it within the limits of our revenues and making sure that we're balancing the budget. And so this year, as we've now expanded this program through 63,000 people and, and more that are signing up even now, um, we're providing that kind of basic health care, right? There's a free doctor visit, there's uh, free pharmaceuticals um, when people are prescribed prescription drugs. Uh, and those are things that will prevent uh, uh, worse 
uh, health effects that may come from not having that kind of coverage. So uh, we're pleased at the kind of coverage that, that we're going to be able to provide. Again, we're trying to put it in a Medicaid-type framework, which it was not in before. Uh, and believe that preventative health care is the best way to go about it. I wish we could provide health care literally for everybody in this country, and we ought to be able to do that. But we need to work toward it rapidly every year, as I have as governor of the state of Illinois. Thank you. So much. Thank you.